Hi, everyone. It's me, host Brianna Whitney. I know most of our listeners right now are expecting episode four of the Sedona Sweat Lodge deaths to be coming out, and it still is next week. But we needed to get this episode out as soon as possible because it was a major break in an Arizona cold case that made national headlines this past week. It's hard to forget a case that's named Little Miss Nobody, and nobody did for 62 years. That's where we're at now, where she finally has her name, and this is her story. This is True Crime Arizona, the podcast. It's July 31st, 1960, a far cry from what life is like now in 2022. 911 wouldn't be invented for eight more years. Zip codes, as we know them today, wouldn't be created for three more years. The Sharpie wasn't even a thing yet. So as you can imagine, the way law enforcement worked was also much, much different. The Yavapai County Sheriff's Office gets a call from a man in a pretty remote area of the county. Somebody who was out looking for rocks, uh, was a, a gentleman out of Las Vegas, was out looking for rocks around Highway 93, the Congress area, Alamo Lake Road, and came across her partially buried body. Called in, our deputies and detectives went out, they recovered her, uh, they you know, tried to identify her. The, of course, this is 1960, medical science has advanced quite a bit since then, but originally she was uh, thought to be a seven-year-old girl because of the state of decompos- decomposition. That was the best estimate that they could give. That's Lieutenant Tom Bolts, who oversees the cold case unit and cold case volunteers at YCSO. Of course, he wasn't with the sheriff's office yet in 1960, but he and his team have started digging into cold cases left and right. The volunteers have now solved five of them. That little girl was never identified back then, so the community of Prescott rallied together to bury her at a local cemetery with a headstone that read, Little Miss Nobody. It's a heartbreaking name. Who was this little girl? It's weighed on Sheriff David Rhodes. You know that when you start these cases, you are filled with hope. You're looking for evidence. You're trying to solve it quickly. You're trying to find your perpetrators quickly. But as time goes on, that hope starts to dissipate. That belief that somehow, someday, you're going to get to the point where you've solved this crime, that starts to dissipate. And a little bit, from my own personal experience, a little bit of despair starts to set in. This would take decades, more than six of them. But Sheriff Rhodes would have a group of cold case volunteers standing at his doorway in 2022. And they came to me one day and they said, hey, guess what? We solved the Little Miss Nobody case. Sharon Lee Gallegos was abducted July 21st, 1960 while playing with two other children in an alley behind her grandmother's house in Amagordo, New Mexico. It's something that our family grew up with this story. Um, In Alamogordo, we were known as that family who had the little girl kidnapped, our aunt, and we revisited it many times during our life. I even did a research paper when I was in high school about my aunt going missing. That's Ray Chavez. His family is from Alamogordo, New Mexico, and he is Little Miss Nobody's nephew. His aunt was Sharon Lee Gallegos, who was just four years old in July of 1960. She would have been turning five soon. Ray was born five years later, but was told stories about Sharon. How was she? Who was she? And she was feisty very feisty, so I can understand why she didn't want to go with that lady who was trying to kidnap her. Um, She was very a a happy-go-lucky, you know, regular, almost five years old. She loved playing with her cousins, and she, she lived with my grandmother and her two siblings and my aunt and a couple of her children. So there was, there was a lot of kids to play with. It was a simple yet fulfilling life for this family. 
Sharon's mom was named Lupe. Sharon would often be with her around town. But on July 21st, 1960, Sharon was abducted while playing out behind her grandma's house with two other young kids. The kidnapping made all the newspaper headlines in Alamogordo at the time. Once YCSO recently got her identity confirmed, they had to work backwards. We had to piece a lot of what happened uh, together from newspaper reports at the time. Uh, the FBI worked on this case, Alamogordo PD worked on this case, the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office worked on this case, uh, but unfortunately those reports uh, are not around anymore. I'm impressed with how much detail they could find on this. What I'm about to play are very key details that could trigger somebody's memory who saw something or knew something from back then. Here's Lieutenant Bolts. There were two kids out playing with uh, Sharon at the time. One, it turns out, was her cousin, who was about six months older than her. She was five years old at the time. There was also an 11-year-old there. They identified a 1951 or a 1952 Plymouth or uh, Dodge sedan, dark green. Uh, one of the two children told uh, somebody, and it ended up in a newspaper article, that there were two kids in the car when the car pulled up, and that one of those kids was a freckled-faced little boy. So we would very much like to be able to identify that kid. Uh, there are a lot of stories, and uh, Ray gave us some more information today that we were unaware of, that a, 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 a woman was in town for about four or five days before July 21st. Uh, there was one account that this woman, uh, after church on Sunday, about five days before uh, Sharon was kidnapped, this woman stayed after church and was asking uh, people around the church about Lupe and about Sharon. Uh, another witness told newspaper, or told law enforcement, and it worked its way to the newspaper uh, a day or two before the kidnapping, that this same woman matching the same description uh, showed up at the neighbor's house asking about Lupe and asking about Sharon and wanted to give Lupe a job. And then we get to the afternoon of July 21st, when the car pulls up, those two kids, the two kids that I, I mentioned earlier, the five-year-old and the 11-year-old, said that the dark green car pulled up. It was driven by a, uh, a, a pale white man. Uh, one account says he had a mustache, brown hair. Uh, that the woman then approached Sharon and said, you know, if you come with us, we'll buy you new clothes and we'll get you some candy. She said she didn't want to go. Uh, the woman then got out of the car, grabbed Sharon by the elbow, and, and pulled her into the car. Uh, law enforcement in Alamogordo then, you know, snapped into action, set up roadblocks. Unfortunately, they didn't locate her. I know. That was a lot of information all at once. But it's extremely important. Whoever took Sharon that day may still be alive. And this is a homicide case, so there's likely a chance they were involved in her death, too. There are some details that, you know, we, we're, this isn't the appropriate place to share those, nor the appropriate time. But there are some details that we are looking to, you know, find out uh, if we can identify those people who were in the car. This account of what witnesses saw leading up to her kidnapping checks out to Ray based on a story he was told about Sharon years ago. She'd love to do errands of go around the block, go to the little grocery store, bring stuff back. She loved to do that. And a couple of weeks before she went, when she was kidnapped, she stopped wanting to do that. She was a little afraid to do that. So that, you know, nobody understood why. And now we do is because she had seen them and they had scared her. I asked Lieutenant Bolts if there was any DNA that didn't belong to Sharon that was found on her body. Unfortunately, back in 1960, we didn't really understand how to store evidence. And like we've covered, like the sheriff covered, uh, detectives back then had no idea that DNA was on the horizon at any point. So the evidence from this case was stored in a vault at the courthouse uh, downtown where the sheriff's office used to be. Uh, 
before I got there, a long time before I got there. And that was kept in a vault. The problem with a vault is there's no air moving through there, and it's dark, and it's conducive to mold. Sometime around 1970, this evidence was re-examined. It was covered with mold, and the decision was made at that point to discard all of the evidence. They lost everything. What a tough blow to investigators today. That makes this case so much harder. By now, there are two questions I'm sure stand out to you listening. One, if Sharon's abduction was all over the news headlines in New Mexico back then, wouldn't that have made its way to Arizona authorities? The answer is yes. I'll touch on that in a second. Two, if all of the evidence was destroyed, how did they identify her now in 2022? To fully answer both of these questions, we have to first rewind back in time just a bit to 2014. We first became aware of uh, Sharon's case uh, around 2014. Uh, we had a volunteer, one of our original volunteer cold case investigators, had gone to a conference, uh, met another cold case uh, investigator volunteer from Colorado who asked him about Little Miss Nobody. And uh, we didn't, you know, all of our records now from 1993 are electronic, they're digital, uh, but this case from 1960 was not digitized, was not electronic. So uh, we had to do some digging to, to find out more about her. YCSO found out she was buried locally, but it was hard to find out any other details about her. So in 2015, they teamed up with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, known as NICMIC, who could help. And in 2016, they were able to get some funding. This is Kathy Clements with NICMIC. In the year 2016, we facilitated the forensic odontology exam to examine the child's teeth and help with a 3D facial reconstruction, which was done and one of our, by one of our forensic artists and giving this little girl a face. The image was shared with the public with the hope that someone might remember her or give us answers or give law enforcement answers. So that picture rendering that's been Little Miss Nobody's face was created in 2016. Even though it wasn't a real picture, it was powerful. You could tell how young this little girl was. It only made everyone want to be able to give her her proper name even more. At that same time, Nick Mick agreed to help fund the exhumation of Little Miss Nobody and fund DNA extraction and testing. Unfortunately, DNA science at that time, as advanced as it was, wasn't advanced enough to give us an identity. While they were researching the entire case, YCSO found out Sharon Gallegos was on their radar right after she was kidnapped. So what happened? Why wasn't she identified then? Authorities from Alamogordo reached out to Yavapai County at some point, we believe in August, and in August said, hey, we had an abduction. We think that your, your uh, found little girl might be our, our kidnapped little girl. Uh, but because of the age difference and the estimation, our estimated age was seven years old. Sharon was four years old when she was taken. She was about to turn five. Uh, that was one reason that they thought that this might not be her. The clothing description was different. And uh, ultimately, there was a footprint comparison made by the FBI back in 1960 that said that the two were not the same. Um, footprint comparisons are not obviously how we do things now, but that was probably the best technology they had available to them at the time. In 1960, people had no idea that DNA would even be a technology. They wouldn't even know what to call it. It didn't exist. So at that time, they ruled out Sharon and moved on to other leads. That brings us to, well, now, modern day. They had that DNA from exhuming her in 2015, but it hadn't gone anywhere. One company was about to change all of that. The company is Othram. The structure of DNA, that double helix that everyone knows and loves, that was discovered uh, in 1953. So it had not even been 10 years since people even knew there was DNA or what that DNA looked like. So I think that's just a really uh, interesting way to kind of position this case within history. David Middleman is the CEO of Othram. What is Othram? It's a company based in Texas that can sequence DNA and create profiles of unknown victims and perpetrators. 
The key players at Othram are David and his wife, Kristen Middleman, and Michael Vogan, who is director of case management. There's a reason why Othram is solving cold cases left and right and is far more advanced than any other company out there. CODIS is the database that law enforcement uses for DNA. CODIS testing focuses on 20 known markers, and they look at those 20 markers and then compare that profile with what is in the known uh, perpetrator CODIS database that exists. And because you're looking at 20 markers, and that's a small number of markers, you have to have a direct match or a very, very close relationship, like maybe parent-child. Um, you can't identify someone that is related. Um, what we do is we look at hundreds of thousands of markers, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of markers for each of these high-performing profiles that we build. And we are able to then infer relationships that are a lot more distant, like fourth cousin. And you get multiple hits, and then you can take that puzzle piece and find where it belongs and create back and figure out where someone's family tree is and what their identity might be. We use the most powerful sequencer on Earth, and we've adopted it to work with forensic evidence. So it's not just the number of markers in the profile, we actually take that evidence that is often a mixture or contaminated with other non-human DNA or degraded because of all the years that have passed, like in this case. And we're able to make that DNA look like fresh DNA, so when we sequence it, we're able to get a profile that looks like a profile that you would get if I swabbed my cheek or your cheek today. There is no one else in the United States that has a lab purpose-built for this cause that does everything in-house. I think we are the only ones. Um, we are definitely the most advanced. We have touched the most evidence. And I think we're building the infrastructure to clear entire backlogs. Michael Vogan explains why they're the only company with this capability and sequencer so far. I think there's like four or five being used in the United States. They're all being used for medical research or, or medical gene therapy. Um, but we basically built the, uh, a forensic end-to-end -end process, proprietary process called forensic grade genome sequencing on top of the world's most powerful sequencer. Um, that's been the reason that we've been able to access information from DNA that wasn't suitable uh, to go through other uh, methodologies or laboratories or even other, other current modern day testing. Othram heard about Little Miss Nobody and reached out to YCSO. They had reached out to us about four or five months before that and said that they would like to uh, try and, and get her identified and try and help us with the case. Uh, they offered to do so with uh, crowdfunding. These things are, are very expensive. And so we ended up uh, partnering with them and, and doing that. And uh, we got that phone call about three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago now, saying that uh, they were 100% certain that, that Little Miss Nobody was Sharon Lee Gallegos. It costs $5,000 to do this kind of testing. Often, police departments and other law enforcement don't have budgets that allow for a ton of money to go toward cold cases. With Little Miss Nobody, YCSO agreed to pay $1,000, and the rest was crowdfunded in a historic amount of time. It was wild to me that this got funded within 24 hours, literally. So, I mean, I think the, the closest before was like a week, and, and uh, it just goes to show, I mean, I think this, this case you know, all, all cases are important and all cases need to get, get answered, but, um, you know, there's a great uh, portrait or, or drawing of what this girl may or may not have looked like, and I think it's very captivating. And then anytime there's, a you know, a young little girl that's that's uh, not named and, and has a name like Little Miss Nobody, it's like, we gotta, we gotta figure out who this girl is. Othram is so advanced that this isn't even close to the oldest case they've helped solve with their technology. You know, we've done cases where we've developed a good DNA profile from bones from 1881. So like, I, I always joke with folks that have doe cases and they're like, well, it's from 1950. Do y'all think you can do it? I'm like, it's younger than 81, 1881. Like, let's give it a shot. Othram didn't even need outside help from other genealogy databases. They were able to do this all on their own, in their own database, which is why it only took a few weeks for them to confirm Sharon Gallegos' identity. The process happened so fast for Ray and his family. So my sister called me right away and said, hey, somebody called again. And we said, okay, we'll see where it goes. And then a couple of days ago, they called again and said, oh, we would like to uh, have a Zoom call with you. And we were like, wow, maybe 
maybe this is going someplace else. Then Friday on that Zoom call, they did tell us the results. We were really overjoyed. We looked into Little Miss Nobody and were amazed at how the people of Prescott and Yavapai County really rallied around her, took care of her for 62 years. And he's right. This community didn't forget about her, ever. It's why the family is still deciding if they're going to bring her back to Alamogordo or keep her at rest here in Arizona. They feel such a strong love and tie to Prescott now. We definitely, no matter what, want to give her a headstone with proper name uh, she, and with her date of birth. Uh, she was born September the 6th, 1955, and share some stories about her. Unfortunately, Sharon's mom, Lupe, has passed away, as has Ray's mom, who was Sharon's sister. But Sharon's brother is still alive. He's in Germany with his wife. Ray is so happy for him. He now has answers about his sister. Somebody else has answers too. The 91-year-old retired homicide investigator at YCSO, who is the only living person who worked on this case back in 1960. He had asked YCSO to call him if Little Miss Nobody was ever identified. The office's public information officer, Kristen Green, called him this past week. His first questions were, you know, was it was it this? Because that's what I thought. But once uh, we explained to him who it was, he remembered Sharon. He remembered part of the the um, investigation back then, and I could I could hear in his voice that he was actually getting quite quite choked up. When Little Miss Nobody was buried, the preacher at the time said somewhere someone is watching to learn what happened to a little girl left on the desert. Well, who you see here as well as many other people over the last 62 years, are the someone who is watching to see what happened and who is that little girl. But there are still so many questions that remain. We would still like to identify the people who took her. We would still like to be able to answer the questions, what happened in those 10 days from the time she was taken to the time she was found. So we are still working. My message to them would be why? Why? Why choose her? She was, they were there for a week or two before, asking questions specifically. You know, why take her? And then 10 days later, she was found deceased. I mean, that, that, that for us doesn't make any sense. You know, it doesn't make any sense. The innocence of a child to take that, you know, why, why? Even be able to give families any answers is what sticks out to David, Kristen, and Michael at Othram. They want to change what's acceptable in forensics right now. This case makes Kristen emotional. Right now, it's okay to say we got a DNA dead end and we can't solve the case. And it shouldn't be. There are new tools in the toolbox, and we should demand to use them until we can get those answers and solve those cases. Being able to change someone's life and give them closure is so meaningful. Or getting justice for someone is amazing. But to be able to do that for everyone, that will change the world. It makes me a lot emotional. Um, I, I couldn't think of anything more meaningful to do with my life. What they can now do, more or less, is changing the landscape of cold cases forever and even just crime as a whole. If there's DNA, if there's any evidence at all, it, from my perspective, the case hasn't gone cold. The case is just waiting for the right technology and the right tools to access it. It's, it's exciting, it gives me optimism for the future, and, um, and it's why we do what we do. You know, we're getting to a point now where if you commit one crime and any DNA is left, you're not gonna have a chance to do another crime. It's driving repeat, repeat crime to extinction. Not every family gets an answer they've been waiting so long for. This case isn't over. The hope is to answer who abducted and killed Sharon Gallegos and why. But watching Ray Chavez beam with gratitude for everyone in the room was something special. We as the family want to say thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for keeping my aunt safe and never forgetting her. It's still sinking in. 
I was talking to Kathy earlier, and I think our family is going to need some resources to kind of deal with this. And uh, we, like I said, we grew up hearing many stories, so all I wanted to be here is to say thank you, and we appreciate everything you've done for us. Thank you very much. Let's give them a... If you have any information on Sharon Lee Gallegos' abduction and homicide, please call the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney, and produced by Sergio Hernandez. This episode was edited by Brad Denny. It's a production of Arizona's Family, 3TV, CBS 5, and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona.